so we find ourselves in an epoch of time where all of a sudden there's this discussion of privileges and this need to kind of get almost to a year zero kind of um, kind of moment in time where everything needs to be changed, where we need to kind of build back better, let's say, and get into something new because the old ways are not sufficient anymore that we had an old modern way. We were changing things like pronouns and the way that we address one another and so forth. But I, I think for, for you, uh, Stephen Hicks, that this kind of has a rather French smell to it. <laughs> All right, well, uh, the tactile metaphor is good. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the French smell is, probably, if we say Swiss French, because I think you're pointing back to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Yeah, Geneva. And yeah, early moderns. Now, I do think uh, modernism and the Enlightenment are just at the beginnings of tapping their potential. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of positive progress ahead of us. But you do, you're quite right, say that we have a large sub-constituency of people who are deeply disquieted by the modern world, uh, who are in many cases antithetical to all of the principles of the modern world. And they are calling for a kind of revolution, even though right. they do not know uh, what the revolution will bring. Instead, they are appalled by modernity and the enlightenment that is in their uh, headlights, so to speak. That's what they want to, uh, to, to bring down and destroy. But yes, uh, history is, is illuminating. Uh, in many cases, things that seem fresh and new uh, have antecedents. I don't subscribe to a cyclical view of history. But well, you are quite right that if we go back to uh, the, the end of the, the, uh, the ancient regime or feudalism and the birth of the modern world, we do find uh, uh, articulations of philosophical, ideological, cultural outlooks uh, among uh, revolutionary types that are uh, being echoed, uh, hmm. often unwittingly echoed by current day uh, anti-modernist, anti-enlightenment thinkers as well. Mm. So when we look at someone like Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and what was he responding to at the time that especially, uh, you know, the social contract and so forth, and, and, and when he was looking at these inequities and so forth, and when he had seen things in front of him, what was it that was, that he was responding to? And then what was his concept, which really, I think you would say, builds the concept of where I think everybody would just stop at Marx when mm -hmm. they're looking at things today. You right. would say, no, let's go back. Right. Well, Marxism certainly did dominate left thought from, you know, say, the, the late 1800s on until the late 1900s or so when it was clear that the game was up for, for Marxism. But there's a kind of a ur socialism or an ur collectivism, I mean, a more basic uh, uh, commitment to that ethos and that way of doing social philosophy and Marxism is one manifestation of it and so the failure of Marxism does not mean that that underlying commitment goes away and what we find is uh, people grope around and they repackage and uh, the same ideas come back in different form so I do think it is fruitful though to say that uh, what has happened to large segments of the left is they've abandoned Marxism and they've abandoned various forms of neo-Marxism they've retained some of the elements of it but uh, the closest historical analog really is someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is uh, essentially uh, uh, born in the early part of the 1700s, dies in the latter part of the 1700s. He uh, is enormously influential on the third wave of the French revolutionaries, but he died uh, about 12 years before uh, or so uh, the, the, the French Revolution actually took place. But the most destructive and nasty phase of the French Revolution was uh, all disciples of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now you're asking, what is he, what's he looking at? Well, he's really looking at two things. One is he's, uh, he's Swiss French, but most of his career is, uh, is in France. And he is looking at uh, kind of the, the dying of the French monarchy and the French aristocracy and kind of the jockeying back and forth between these two that had been going on for, for, for centuries. Uh, you know, really for much of the 1600s and 1700s, the monarchy had been in the ascendancy. Much of the aristocracies were really uh, you know, lap dogs and toy poodles of the monarchy, but the monarchy was weak toward the end of the 1700s and the aristocrats had sensed that weakness and they were building a power base. They were the ones who were then going to be able to force the estates general 
that uh, really is the, the political uh, benchmark for the transition or the beginning of the end of the monarchy and what's going to result in the French Revolution. So we do have a decaying monarchy. Uh, we do really have a degenerate aristocracy in France. And Rousseau, like most other <laughs> early moderns, are saying this is disgusting, it's morally repulsive, and this has to go, we need to raise it to the ground and, and start over. Uh, and so in that sense, he sounds very modern. Right? But at the same time, this is uh, getting into the seven, second part of the 1700s. This is already two, three, four generations after the British Enlightenment, right. the, uh, the English Enlightenment with its glorious revolution, and England has mostly peacefully transitioned into a modern kind of parliamentary democratic kind of society and so forth. Uh, England has uh, quietly become a second or uh, from being a second or third rate power to being, you know, arguably one of the great powers built on the backs of uh, open markets, uh, uh, agricultural revolution, early industrial revolution, early capitalism and so forth. So uh, and lots of uh, uh, toleration for dissenting views, you know, the acts of religious toleration had largely been put in place. So England was, uh, uh, and, and, and Scotland made its uh, intellectual contributions to it as well a little bit later. Uh, it's really Francis Bacon, John Locke, Isaac Newton, all 17th century Englishmen who I think are the first Enlightenment uh, philosophers. The Scottish Enlightenment is a little bit later. It's a 1700s philosophy. And Voltaire, uh, mm. early in the 1700s, had, uh, you know, <laughs> being Voltaire, been brilliant with words and, uh, you know, not taking anything, any crap from anybody. He uh, had ended up being uh, exiled from France uh, as a result of uh, having challenged a member of the aristocracy who deserved to be, uh, to be challenged. But mm. he's banished to England, so he goes over to England. He sees what the English are doing, saying, this is great, it's wonderful. Just imagine this, right? A Frenchman going to England at this time and saying, the English are doing it right, right? And then coming back to France and then writing his letters from England, basically a, a glorification of the English Enlightenment, but because it's got the brilliance of Voltaire's prose and his take no prisoners attacking anybody, uh, we start to see an importing of uh, the Enlightenment into France. And uh, then the you know the glories of the French Enlightenment, and there really were some significant glories in the 1700s. Montesquieu, hmm. Diderot, and all of these guys, brilliant, brilliant stuff going on. Uh, and again, uh, in a in a in a pro reason, uh, pro every individual can take charge of his life. Uh, uh, and, and, and to some extent, her life, kind of early feminist thought, right? That there's something morally repulsive about slavery and we need to do something about this. Uh, still, of course, uh, all kinds of racisms and prejudices and going on, but for the first time, significant number of intellectuals starting to challenge that and talking about the inherent dignity of all human beings, no matter what their creed is, no matter what their race is, and so on. So the French uh, Revolution is a, uh, sorry, the French uh, Enlightenment really is a, is a magnificent thing. Uh, I want to give some props to the encyclopedia. You know, we talk now in the 20th century and 21st century about Jimmy Wales and Wikipedia and what a magnificent accomplishment that is, in fact, bringing all of that huge knowledge to everybody, and everybody can participate in the creation of this encyclopedia. The French uh, Encyclopedia, uh, edited by D Diderot and d'Alembert, a similar project. We're going to imagine the, the ambition of this. We're going to take all of human knowledge and commission articles by experts on it, get it written down, and it's not just going to be theoretical knowledge about religion and politics and philosophy and history and all this. It's going to be practical knowledge. How do you build a working smithy, right? How do you make an anvil? How do you build a loom with illustrations and so forth that can be read by the common man and the common woman? And they can then uh, read this. And there were reading groups that got together to read parts of the encyclopedia. So it's going to be universal knowledge. And on the basis of that, we're going to build you know, a brand new society. So this is the French Enlightenment building on the, on the English Enlightenment. And just to you know that they are comrades in arms here, uh, it is interesting that uh, the French Enlightenment, if you look at the dedication page of the French Enlightenment, and again, this is a group of French scholars, and you consider the, the, you know, the centuries of animosities between the French and the English. Mm -hmm. and it was just war, 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 we hate you, <laughs> we hate right. you, right? And, and, and everything. For the first time, right, we have uh, a, a camaraderie among the leading figures, right, to the point where the, 
the, uh, the leading intellectuals, the philosophes in the French Enlightenment, are dedicating the, uh, the encyclopedia, and it's dedicated to three Englishmen, Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, and John Locke. Mm -hmm. right? And that says something huge about the, uh, the intellectual landscape. Now, to come back to Rousseau, Rousseau is uh, against the aristocracy, he's against the monarchy, and all of that hierarchy and, and privilege, right? That privilege concept is a hot concept in the 1700s, but he's also against the Enlightenment. He is against the English Enlightenment, hates John Locke, he's a, he's a bitter foe of, of, of Voltaire. Mm -hmm. If you read some of the exchanges between the two of them, it's quite scatological. <laughs> 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 I don't know, uh, if we, you know, Voltaire uh, you know, writes uh, that uh, reading Rousseau makes him want to throw all of his clothes off and go back to crawling on all fours in the dirt again, <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, right, and, and then Rousseau it, it re responds with all kinds of insults, right, as well. So the point is that uh, uh, he is opposed to everything that the en Enlightenment conception of what modernity can and should be. And Rousseau is, is an opponent of that. You see the emphasis on reason and empirical knowledge that the Enlightenment philosophers are, are developing. Now, sure, some of them are more rationalistic and so forth, but uh, Rousseau is opposed to reason. Right? He thinks it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an after-the-fact, uh, weaker facility that we should be passionate and emotion-driven, right, and so forth. He also understands that a lot of the arguments this is also the heyday of natural theology. A lot of the arguments uh, with respect to religion are undercutting traditional religion. And uh, much of the push is, is, among the Enlightenment uh, thinkers is toward the separation of church and state. Rousseau is opposed to the separation of church and state. Now, it's true he doesn't want to just go back to old-fashioned traditional religion. He wants a kind of a more sanitized, state-run, modernized religion. But nonetheless, there's not going to be any any uh, and any separation of church and state and he's quite explicitly saying uh, there will be execution if you publicly <laughs> go against whatever the new state religion uh, is going to be uh, the enlightenment is all about free speech people need to be able to think for themselves read for themselves argue about all of these very important ideas in politics and uh, and religion and so forth, uh, and Rousseau is saying absolutely not. We are going to have censorship of the press. Freedom of the press is one of the most disastrous things that has uh, has possibly happened. The Enlightenment is celebrating the arts and all of the participatory arts. Uh, 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 Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Rousseau, perhaps uh, in, in a nod to his Calvinist Genevan roots, wants to shut down the theaters, right, and so forth. Yep, he yep. hates science. He hates uh, modern uh, the developments in the arts and the whole idea that somehow human beings are making moral progress as a result of the Enlightenment and figuring out the way the world works. He thinks, in fact, the opposite of that is true. Science and the arts are corrupting us, making us worse and worse, and we need not to go back to the old hierarchies of feudalism and, you know, king and, and church and state and high, 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 uh, high aristocracy and monarchy, but also this idea of individualism and freedom and people going their own way and this progressive vision of society, he hates all of that. And really what he is in favor of is a new kind of primitivism, that in some sense, you know, we can't go back to the good old days of the, uh, uh, you know, of the, of, uh, the Garden of Eden, however much we secularize that, or to, to early man, but we do, can go back to some sort of pre-scientific, pre-civilized tribal state of human beings uh, in which we are extraordinarily communal and we're, we are, we, we're, we're not trying to do our own thing and, and be uppity with respect to each other. And so it's modern, uh, primitive, egalitarian, back to nature, uh, and that's what Rousseau is all about. Mm -hmm. So what we then really have in the modern world is, uh, of course, there are conservatives who want, do want to go back to the good old days, who thinks all of modernity is a mistake, but really do have a, then a kind of a three-way battle between those who are uh, in favor of the Enlightenment and see it as a progressive, pro-science, pro-individual, pro-reason, pro-arts and culture development, and, uh, and those who are like Rousseau, heavily tribal, or the Rousseauians, uh, I need to generalize it now, uh, uh, and, and, and have a very different egalitarian, but then at the same time, a state run uh, at, a, at a localized level understanding of what modern society should develop into. So, mm, mm. Uh, now, 
So, you know, if we want to come back to, to, to modern times right now, you know, one of the big divides, of course, we have is between those who say we live in a magnificent society and a magnificent culture that has solved a lot of problems. But of course, we have some other problems that we are still working on. But let's stay the course and uh, continue on with modernity and the Enlightenment. And we have a whole lot of people who uh, say, no, we're against all of that, but we're also against the old conservative visions and, and the hierarchy people. We just want to tear everything down, but they seem to be uh, rather primitivist in their understanding and communalist uh, and anti-rational in all of their techniques. So, in a way, it's uh, Rousseau repackaged. Hmm. So, a lot of things then uh, that have come now, that we see now, and also that we see having their start in the mid-19th century, then especially are realized in the early 20th century and mid-20th century, that really the seeds of collectivism began with Rousseau in many mm. ways. Is that correct? I would say the seeds of modern collectivism are okay. Rousseauian. Collectivism is, correct. is correct. ancient. Yes. Right. right. You know, you see it back in, in, uh, in Plato. Most of the utopian right. schemes that are developed over the course of you know, some thousands of years are collectivist. You know, from you know, Plato to religious communes formalized in both Eastern and Western religions and in Thomas More's utopia, right, and so forth. But uh, those are typically seen as pre-modern right, forms. Uh, I think it, it's fair to say that it's Rousseau who has a, has a, a uniquely modernized understanding of, of collectivism. And then there's a lot of building then on Rousseau. So we have Rousseau, of course, Rousseau passes before the beginning of the French Revolution. We have the French Revolution that was absolutely historic in terms of what actually occurred there. Um, yep. And it was very different than the American Revolution in a way. Yes. You know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. What happened with the American Revolution is uh, English Enlightenment, you know, Francis Bacon with his empirical methods and scientific approach, uh, Isaac Newton, uh, you know, a brilliant you know, naturalistic understanding, but with more sophisticated mathematics and a generalization on a lot of the early science. So scientific method is much more worked out and you have a robust physics at that time. And then Lockean philosophy, which has an epistemology, right, which has an understanding of human nature, you know, with individual agency and, uh, you know, the ability to shape your character and take charge of your life. And it's all of a more worldly ethic, and then a, a clear uh, a separation of church and state, doctrines of religious toleration, limited government, respect for life, liberty, property, all of that becomes uh, very widely read in, uh, in, 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 uh, in British philosophy, but that's what gets carried across the Atlantic and becomes the de facto uh, cultural machinery that's not the best metaphor, but for uh, for the American the American ethos, mm. and so the American Revolution. So there they had their revolutionaries two generations after John Locke has died. But by that time, you know Thomas Jefferson, you know, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and so forth. They are born into an American culture that is uh, largely a Lockean culture. This is slightly an overstatement, but it's largely. A Lockean culture, right? The French Revolution. It's largely a Rousseauian, Rousseauian culture, but I have to say that's in the in the third phase. We'd have to drill down mm. into into French Revolution. So the French Revolution was initially launched by the aristocrats, right? It's they who forced the king mm. to convene the Estates General, which was you know a, a more I don't want to say democratic. It's actually a more republican kind of institution where right. all of the major factions in French society have a seat at the table and they they hash things out and so forth. Yeah, the, uh, but the aristocrats kind of lost control and things did go in a much more liberal fashion. And so there were a large number of kind of English Enlightenment, but now French Enlightenment thinkers, you know, like Condorcet and Lafayette and, and others. And at the, the era of the Declaration of the Rights of the Man and the Citizen, uh, there's a lot of overlap between that document and, and the American Revolution. But there also were the the much more radicalized Rousseauians, we mm. would call them hardcore violence advocates, hardcore collectivists, uh, hardcore uh, overthrow all of society types of people. And here we're talking about Robespierre, who carried around with him, you know, the way you know, religious people will carry around a copy of the Quran if they're Muslim, or carry around a copy of the Bible if they are Christian, and consulted in moments of reflection and. Mm. 
and so forth. He carried around Rousseau with him. He was a true believer, and Saint Just was a Rousseauian, and Marat was a Rousseauian, mm -hmm. and all of the worst of the worst uh, are Rousseauians, and they just proved to be more ruthless, but also more effective political players of that particular environment. So it went from an aristocratic phase where the aristocrats really wanted to have a, a, a reformed monarchy and, of course, grab some more power to themselves. But then it went through a more liberal phase and then it was taken over by the, uh, the, uh, the Robespierrean and it became the, the reign of terror. Uh, and it is very instructive to contrast, you know, the American Revolution. I think, you know, this is what your, your comment is about with the French Revolution, because there you do have kind of a, a desperate, in a way, civil war, because many of the American revolutionaries initially did think of themselves as inheritors of the British tradition. So it was a kind of, it was kind of a fratricidal break that is going on. Uh, and we know what happens with fratricidal breaks. They get enormously terrible, and a lot of terrible things happen in the French Revolution, but there is a difference between the cultural ethos and the political ethos that Lockeanism brings with it. There is a bottom line respect for the individual and a respect for civility mm -hmm. that uh, stops it from de degenerating into sheer barbarism. Mm. And that all got stripped away in the case of the, the French Revolution because the Rousseauianism takes you in that in that further direction. Once you become a collectivist, mm -hmm. bottom line, you don't see individuals anymore. When you stop seeing individuals anymore, you dehumanize the enemy at a <laughs> further level and you are willing to do worse things. Also, you don't see yourself as an individual anymore and that strips away any sense of I am responsible. And once people don't see themselves as individually responsible, they dehumanize themselves. They're willing to do more brutal things and that's exactly what happened in the French Revolution, and it's actually what happens in any collectivized revolution. So, uh, yes, the, uh, there's a whole, uh, there's a beginnings of, of a lot of good work that's done, but comparing the American Revolution with the uh, French Revolution, enormously instructive. And I would actually round that out to the trilogy of you know, the the British Glorious Revolution. There's a reason why it was glorious. You know, it was it was a revolution with minimal. Uh, actually, zero bloodshed. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, right. You know, so you have a new king comes into in, into power, and Parliament basically says, "We don't like you. We don't want you to be our king. Please go away." You know, I'm telling, making a very short story, and the king says, "Okay," right, and goes <laughs> away. And they, you know, they look around and say, you know, to uh, William of Orange, you know, "Would you like to be our king?" And mm -hmm. he says, "Well." By golly, yes, I would, right? And <laughs> brings his lovely bride over, and so it's the British way of doing things, right? But right. that's that's the way you do a revolution. So why? Uh, now, this is a little bit uh, potted history, of course. But why did the Grevel or Glorious Revolution glow so gloriously? Mm. Why the American Revolution was pretty bad, but not as bad? And why the French Revolution went so horribly, right. horribly bad? Now, I say this is a little bit potted because maybe you can say the British got a lot of it out by having their own civil war mm -hmm. uh, 40 years earlier, and that one did get pretty nasty yeah. and, and so forth. Yeah. So when you, th when you look at things today and, and through the history of, of thought, you know, it, there is somehow this embrace of Rousseau and his concepts that folks that want to be involved in a revolution that they end up jumping back to, as opposed to looking at what happened in America, or as you just said, in, in England. Sure, that's and, right. And so we look at this, then we, we move from the French Revolution, and then what are the other philosophers and other great thinkers, uh, and not so great sometimes, but where we move into the age prior to Marx in the next, let's say, 100 years? What actually... Yeah. So Rousseau dies in the 1770s, Marx and Engels write Communist Manifestos, in, uh, published in 1848. So we're talking about a 70 year span, and that's right. maybe two generations of, of people. And obviously there's a lot of philosophical development that goes on. The way we tell the, uh, the, uh, the history of philosophy story is, uh, uh, is Kant. And Kant was a, a brilliant philosopher. I think he's wrong on all fundamentals, but I do have to say that he is the most important philosopher of the last 200 years. But there's a whole other story that we would tell there. One connection is going to be that, uh, that Kant was inspired in part in his moral and political philosophy by a reading of Rousseau. Uh, and so one of the th things that's uh, controversial 
about Kant is that he's often upheld as, a, as an enlightenment figure. And there's a case that can be made for that. I, I don't think it's a strong case or a compelling case, but there are a lot of counter-enlightenment threads in them, and one of them, and you have to dig die rather deeply to find out what those are, but there is a kind of collectivized Rousseauianism that uh, is, is built into Kant's moral and political mm -hmm. philosophy. So that comes out more strongly in a thinker like Hegel, right, who is then, in this, the history of philosophy story that we tell, Right, Kant comes along, revolutionizes German philosophy. He basically conquers the German intellectual world. And that's saying a lot because, uh, you know, the, the, the British had done great philosophy in the previous century. The French had been brilliant in the 1700s, but they're resting on their laurels to some extent. And it really is by the end of the 1700s and on into the 1800s, the Germans who uh, are the most brilliant philosophy. So the 19th century is the century of German philosophy. So Kant is absolutely uh, important here. Uh, in the next generation, uh, Hegel right, is born, and he is also someone who is enormously, as a young man, inspired by his reading of Rousseau. Rousseau. And you'll find much more explicitly in, uh, in Hegel, uh, communitarian, to put it lightly, to, uh, to outright collectivist and authoritarian sorts of philosophies as well. And then uh, uh, this part of the story is much more told because, you know, you go from Kant to Hegel and the next generation you have Marx and uh, the connections then between Marx and Hegel. Now we're in the middle part of the, uh, the, the 1800s and then in the next generation the giant is, uh, is Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. So Kant, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, that's a story that needs to be told. But uh, Hegel probably is the most important big next person to, right. to talk about. And then Hegel, and we, when we jump from Rousseau to Hegel, is that we're talking about um, men who were not materialist in the sense that Marx was. Uh, they were right. still metaphysical in their approach. Yes, that's right. So, so far we've really been emphasizing the, the cultural, the ethical, the social, political right, aspects of, uh, of, of Rousseauianism and, and the Enlightenment. And uh, you know, as important as I think Rousseau was, I don't see him as a first-rate philosopher. I would say he's, you know, second-rate, that's, that's still pretty high praise, right, to say someone's a second-rate philosopher in the grand scoop of things. But uh, and part of the reason for that is that when you get into metaphysical issues and epistemological issues, kind of the deepest issues in philosophy, he's got some views there, but they're not well worked out. Mm. Uh, so he has some kind of a full system of philosophy, but it's not worked out in the mm. level of detail of someone like Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, mm. Kant, Hegel, and, and so forth. So it is someone like Hegel and, and Kant, right, who come along and they have the full system and it's all worked out. And, uh, and as you're, as you're pointing to us now, the metaphysical issues and the uh, epistemological issues become important. And one of those is uh, uh, the issue of materialism versus kind of idealism. And uh, one of the big shifts that starts to occur in German philosophy is their revolt against British philosophy and French philosophy. And they're going to argue that it is much too naturalistic and it ends up being much too reductive and materialistic and uh, part of the the counter enlightenment that's going to develop is to say that we need to find some way to reintegrate a spiritualism into the philosophy right. but it can't be an old-fashioned stuffy religious spiritualism and so that comes to be called idealism Mm. And, and it's the brilliance of their original arguments in metaphysics and epistemology. And again, I disagree with all of them, but I have to say they are brilliant and they are enormously right. influential. And they tell the story of, of philosophy. So yes, we do have to start talking about idealism. And Hegel is usually labeled, you know, the most brilliant speculative idealist philosopher of the uh, of the early 1800s when he comes into his own as a mature thinker and starts publishing the phenomenology and then working his way through all of the, the branches of philosophy. So yes. So when we're, when we're looking from the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s, I think that everybody that's looking at things today through the lens of what they see happening around them from the confirmation bias that they see and so forth is that they're just looking then back to Marx Engels. But we would say that there's probably you know, this period, as, as you stated, from the mid 1700s to just before Marx, that was incredibly, um, um, how, how should we say that, it was so influential on what's happening today. And much of the thought that's actually being created today is not 
purely Marxist in, 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 in that sense. But also there's a lot of, and especially with Kant, would you say, that this would be the beginning of, of really the shapings of the echoes later on that would be postmodernism in many ways. Yeah, uh, yeah, so postmodernism obviously, uh, you know, hugely important to understanding the intellectual and cultural landscape where we are right now. And then when you start doing the intellectual genealogy stories, a lot of the lines do get traced back to Marx, right? Of course, but certainly for more for the political and, and the uh, ethos there and, and, and the structures of oppressor, oppressed and uh, exploiter, exploited, uh, and a certain amount of dialectic and so on. And that's very well worked over territory. And I think it's important to go through your Marxism and your neo-Marxism and the cultural Marxism and see how a significant amount of postmodernism does come, come out of, come out of that. But uh, on the metaphysics and the epistemology, I do think, yeah, the story does go back to Heidegger and behind Heidegger, someone like Nietzsche and behind someone like Nietzsche, not Marxism, but rather a kind of Hegel and Schopenhauer, we haven't said anything about Schopenhauer yet, and behind all of them, uh, Kant. And so there we have to start doing deep metaphysics and epistemology. So for example, when the postmoderns, for example, are talking about power, now we have our understanding about what power is, but it starts to become very bewildering when we're trying to think, what do the postmoderns mean by power? And it becomes very difficult. And, uh, and frankly, the reason for that is that they don't mean by power what most of us mean by power. Hmm. They have a deeply metaphysically different understanding of power. And that means you have to go back and read Nietzsche. And you have to, behind Nietzsche, read Schopenhauer. And uh, you have to read Hegel. And uh, so we have a very different tradition here. Now, the postmodern thinkers, uh, so if we start naming people like Foucault, Foucault will say things like, you know, the formative thinkers on me are Heidegger and uh, uh, Nietzsche. Right? Deeply, deeply formative. And this is, so, so we have to go back and read those guys. Uh, someone like Richard Rorty will say it's Heidegger. Mm. And he will say that postmodernism really is just the, 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 the end of the trail, uh, all of the roads uh, having been explored and the byways, right, and so forth, going all the way back to Hegel. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you really want to understand where we are, we are kind of at the end of a Hegelian mm -hmm. odyssey that has reached its dead end, and now we are we are in postmodernism. So, yes, yes, there's absolutely important uh, territory uh, to be explored before Marx that I think is is making a comeback. You know, it's not just that we're we're not pure Marxist anymore, or even uh, like Zizek. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Zizek. That's right. That's right. Zizek he's a, he's is a Hegelian. Guy. That's right. So mm -hmm. he's done his Marxist odyssey, right, and so forth, and now he says, "I'm a Hegelian." So we have to go back and understand what the heck does that mean? What does it mm -hmm. mean to be a Hegelian? And with all of these guys, it's it's difficult territory. Mm -hmm. I think I see this same sort of pattern happen. What we're talking about is that where you have folks that maybe come into a, a certain, you know, faith community and they, they jump into, well, I first started with this particular uh, theologian who brought me in. I started to understand these, but then I had to go deeper and then I had to go deeper and then I had to go deeper to really understand things. So it's almost like we're creating a faith tradition here. Right. And that's something that you pointed out. And that's really what brought us first together. Right, time right. Ago. Well, this is actually a through line that I'm, you know, listening to Stephen. Mm -hmm. um, what I see here is almost like a metaphysical statism in this whole kind of Wow. line that we've been talking about. You've got Rousseau with his, you know, very collectivist sort of view. You go in, especially though, when you get to Hegel, who's relatively famous for having said something like, uh, the state is a divine idea as it's expressed on earth. And so definitely a statist, uh, or at least a proto-statist. Um, with he and Kant, you have all the idealism. So for, for Hegel in particular, you have idealism. It's like the ideas are the perfect thing, and the state becomes, in a sense, one of its worldly manifestations of that perfect thing. And so if we could just get the ideas perfect, then the state will perfect itself. And then we're kind of, the, the, when we talk about this kind of Hegelian odyssey, mm. it's, it's almost this trail, but it has roots back in Rousseau of, of a metaphysical kind of statist view where, and this is what I see in, in the movements that we look at today, right? is that, you know, the same kind of view that if well, if we could just perfect the culture, or were the postmodernists, if we could just perfect the discourses, then we'd be able to undo all the systems of oppression, and we'd be able to enter into this kind of liberated era 
uh, where there are no systems of oppression holding us down. You know, Marx and the Marxists talked about this ideal democracy. That was really a neo-Marxist idea that got really developed. Ideal democracy. Well, what does that look like? Well, that looks like when we're now liberated from systems of oppression. And the way that they argued that we should achieve that is by engaging in this dialectic. And where does the dialectic come from? Well, Kant first, and then Hegel fills it in, fleshes it out, turns it into a proper big project. Um, and so again, we have this whole concept of a, of a, of a kind of large-scale statist project where if we can get whether it's the ideas or the economy or the means of production or the, the culture or the language, the discourses, we can get these things just right. If we can get the right control over all of these things, so mm-hmm. or seize the means of, of material production or economic production, seize the means of, of um, cultural production, that's your cultural Marxist, seize the means of discourse production, that would be kind of the, not the postmodernists themselves who are tearing everything down, but the people who have inherited those ideas and put them to, to applicative use, what we called applied postmodernism in cynical theories. Uh, we can just, if we can engineer the discourses correctly, then people will think the right ways and they, more importantly, won't think the wrong ways. Right. And we can show these kinds of, we can, we can do these kinds of things through a appeal to a state that's getting better and better and better. Um, and so I see this through line between all of these thinkers that we've just discussed as kind of the birth of, as the answer to the question, well, if we're going to get rid of the monarchy, we're going to get right. rid of that old kind of thinking, we're going to go into something, but we hate the Enlightenment, well, what is it going to be? And it's this kind of metaphysically based statism. Well, from, you know, for Hegel, it was historicist. It was, you know, we know that there's a, mm. he believed there was a trajectory or even a talos to history. Marx materialized this said, well, when we get the conditions, the material conditions right and get out of our heads, we can turn Hegel back upright and we can get him on his feet. And then you see this with the neo-Marxists, like, no, we have to put Hegel back upright again. Uh, Marx got too involved in this economic determinism kind of thing. And we have to get back to this, that the ideas of society are somehow relevant and they express themselves through culture. So culture becomes uh, upstream from politics and then we can achieve our means mm. that way. And so we have this kind of at the end of the day, you have this state that's going to control whatever it is, culture or produ- cultural productions, economic production, discourses, and so linguistic production or, or even cognitive production on a level. And once we get it all right and everybody's on board, well then, as Hegel might have had it, you know, the absolute will realize itself for what it is. It will see itself reflected in this now understanding other, realize itself, and the end of history can arrive. And so you have this metaphysical statism mm. to the perfected end of history to the utopia and of course the collectivist strand runs through this because if everybody's not on board or everybody that's still alive is not on board um, then it won't work so you, what do you have to do is you have to first try to convince then you have to start to try to compel then you have to start to try to force and in the experiments through the 20th century with these ideas that force came in rather brutal fashion at the end of barrels of a gun what it would look like in this highly technological 21st century with the gun still somewhere behind everything is less clear. You know, digital control, algorithms to control the way people think, the information they receive, who can and cannot be on social media, etc. So I see this through line that there's a metaphysical aspect to um, the understanding of the world that has built atop of that a statist, a collectivist and statist uh, mentality. And the roots are in the exact philosophers that we just talked about, and the expressions have developed and evolved over time where each of these have hit dead ends. Oh, economic production didn't work. Catastrophe. What about cultural? And this is where you have your Gramsci. This is where you have your Horkheimer. This is where you have Marcuse. We're going to, our Adorno complaining about jazz. We're going to get into all of these elements of how we produce culture and say, well, if we just get that right, then we can be liberated. And then the postmodernists, so no, 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 because they have the structuralist tradition behind them. And if we can just get the words right, if we can just understand, make the meaning in the right order, and we don't constrain people, we don't limit their potentialities. Um, can, yeah, jump in on that very yeah. well, very well said. So I like your phrase, uh, the metaphysical statism. And so mm-hmm. the, uh, the state is the embodiment of these forces at work. Yes. Right? Uh, and, and those forces at work construct us as individuals, but it has its own agenda. So what it is to be constructed as an individual is going to evolve over over time. 
Uh, uh, but the state is, of course, a, a localized vehicle. So there's a kind of metaphysical communalism that stands yep. behind that. So the state yeah, is yeah. representing the community, and the community is really the metaphysical reality. Right. So and this this that's metaphysical very Foucauldian, right? That's the well, epistem. That's, yes. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. Going back to the Hegel. Sure. Sure. And uh, and 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 Kant territory. But yes, absolutely. This is the thing. That gets carried through into into post. Well, there is, so, it is it's folkish thinking, right? Well, yeah, yeah, sure, that's right. And so other the less known names, you have people like Herder and Fichte and others become become uh, important contributors as well. But just on this this metaphysical issue, I mean, to put it bluntly, you know, the issue of metaphysics is what is the nature of reality, and what's the relationship between our minds and reality. And bluntly, the dichotomy in the entire history of philosophy is to say there is a pre-existing reality out there, and our minds are responsive to it. And if we're going to have uh, truth and objectivity and so forth, then the reality that is out there sets the terms, and we need to stay in connection with with reality. So mind is responsive uh, to reality. And if we want to reshape reality, first we need to understand the way reality is on mm. its own terms to get it right. Otherwise, if we try to reshape it, we're going to mess up and it's not going to work and so forth. Mm. The other is to say that rather than our minds being responsive fundamentally to reality is that our minds are constitutive of reality or reality is created by our minds. Right. Now, if you put that out there and very baldly, it sounds like you are psychotic. Right, so mm -hmm. <laughs> reality is whatever I say reality is. Right, I reject and your reality and substitute right. and so, my own. It, yeah. Which is, so, of course, there are some philosophical positions right who go there, but we typically want to write those people off. And if I could right? briefly interject as well as we were preparing for this discussion and so forth, with you know, I had referenced the fact that George Bernard Shaw, you know, of the Fabians, you know, his famous uh, musical play and so forth was Pygmalion. Yes, you know, and then oh, yeah, this is oh, good. and yeah. oh, by the way, uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau also penned a musical play, and it was Pygmalion. Mm. And so, of course, the, uh, the, the myth uh, behind Pygmalion, of course, is a man who is carving out the, the, the ivory statue of his perfect idealized woman, who then would come to life. That's right. This, so it starts in your head. You have an idea, yeah. right? Right. And a vision, right? And yes. reality then changes itself and reconstitutes itself to make your vision a reality. Right. Now, if you uh, had the individual artist doing this, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, there there is something to that as an aesthetic yeah. theory, right? But right, as a right. metaphysical theory, that reality comes into existence, and I create the laws of reality or the mm -hmm. rules of reality, and I can make it what I, right. Then that that becomes problematic. But what you find is that if you collectivize that, it starts to sound much more attractive. You know, reality is what we say reality according to the rules of our society uh, yep. and now think about the linguistic form of this right what uh, many and this is getting closer to postmodernism but this is one of the the uh, the metaphysical idealisms through linguistic theory that feeds into postmodernism and it is uh, precisely the idea that somehow language uh, uh, which is a product of our minds creates its own reality in a collectivized form. So the argument there is going to be, you know, you're born as an individual. It's not the case that you as an individual, you have your own sense organs in your mind and you can look out and see the way the world is and form your own judgments and parents and teachers are supposed to help you uh, to develop your own mind. Rather, this theory says you are born and your mind is a kind of a blank slate, but you're born into a community and that community has its own language. And we don't ask where that language comes from. And if we're already skeptical about epistemological issues, we'll say we don't see any way of mapping our language onto the way the reality works. All we have is these communities have these uh, linguistic rules, a lot of them, of course, sure, they're arbitrary. We could change the rules of language. And we have all of these words that we think they have meanings, but we don't say that they have meanings in connection to reality. You know, we could uh, change the words meaning and make them do something else. But individuals in their thinking about the nature of reality are molded by the language that they learn. And so then all of those arguments about whether the syntax and the grammars of various languages are universal or different become very important. But the idea is that you basically are collectively conditioned to a certain 
way of thinking about the way the reality is. That becomes your community's truth with all of its values, right, and so forth. And then life is a matter of trying to then make that realized in, in, in reality. Uh, and so you do have a metaphysical, collectivized understanding of the way the world works. And it's not that I just make it up, but we rather make it up. And uh, that's taking you very close to postmodernism. Yeah, that'll get you right there. As the social constructivist thesis falls, yes, r at its most extreme, falls right out of the the, the back end of that. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, exactly everything right. is a social construction, and everybody is socialized by the language, the discourses, but also the norms that these create, and they're socialized into how they're going to be that's right. to the point where. Simone de Beauvoir's statement that one isn't born but becomes a woman, which mm -hmm. can be interpreted in a number of ways, it's interpreted completely literally that yes. one be is made into a woman, in fact, by right. that socializing condition. So then if you can engineer the discourses, you can change what it means to become a woman, or you can change what That's it means right. to become a man, or you can change what it means to be anything in, in some sense. Um, so, yeah, so a little sidestep from du, du Beauvoir, I think the, the existentialists are very important here, and so Jean-Paul Sartre, who was sure. her comrade in arms uh, in a lot of ways, you know, with his famous essay, Existentialism is a Humanism, uh, you know, in that essay, he is uh, kind of stepping forth onto the world stage directly after World War II. He'd been mostly known as a literary figure, but uh, writing enough about existentialism, you know, God is dead, that was, of course, Nietzsche, but with his atheistic understanding of existentialism, drawing out the implications of that. So, uh, you know, he's starting to get pushback from the Marxists who are materialistic and saying, no, uh, you, uh, everything is social construction and necessary economic forces working their way out. So there's no zone for individual freedom and so forth. And he's also getting beaten up on by religious people, particularly the Catholic Church in France, because then, you know, if it's all just subjective values, right, and so forth, as existentialism says, right. So he's, in one sense, hearing it from the, the, the cultural and political right as represented by the Catholic Church and then also from the atheistic right. left. Right from the Marxists, and he's trying to stake out a third middle way with a kind of radical, uh, you know, human beings are not born with an essence. Right. There is no such thing as a human nature, and, and right. biology and all of that stuff doesn't matter. We are we are radically free, and we just make subjective commitments. And uh, the only way we can have an authentic life is by making an authentic commitment and 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 sticking to it. So that ties in to the de Beauvoir right, remarks sure. when she's tailoring them to, to feminism. But then even you find uh, in, this, in this essay, that sounds like radically individualistic, subjectivistic. And uh, Sartre is often interpreted, and I think misinterpreted uh, in this way, because it sounds like then you're saying, well, you know, if I then commit to being a, uh, a child rapist, you know, there, there's nothing to stop me from doing that. Now, we might then say some of the postmodernists <laughs> didn't have a problem with that particular <laughs> implication. You know, we'll come to that a little bit later, uh, right? Or a serial killer, right? Or, or whatever. And you see uh, Sartre recognizing that's a place he does not want to be. He doesn't right. want to be an individual collectivist. So he, d he is completely illogical, as far as I can tell, from, from the, his metaphysical and epistemological starting points. But he does say, no, when I am making a, a commitment, I as an individual, I am not choosing for me. I am choosing for my community. And I'm, he's trying to bring in a kind of Rousseauian general will or a Kantian universalizability, hmm. and he's very aware of that tradition. So the commitments that we are making, these are all collectivized commitments, and that's where we're going to get some sort of morality. But it's not going to come from God. It's not going to come from the necessary uh, forces of history working out. And it's not just going to be coming from, from me making a free choice. It's a, going to be a collectivized, communalized uh, choice. And then we're going to impose that on reality. Right. You want to jump in on that? Well, not on that specifically. I was just thinking a, a bit, and it, it struck me when we were talking a, a moment ago, when we, we'd been talking about Hegel and uh, the metaphysical commitments behind this kind of communalism, and the comment that I'd, I'd raised with um, the, 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 the state is a divine idea exp as it is ex gets expressed on Earth. It, you know, his metaphysic there, and I don't mean to jump far from existentialism, but uh, no. uh, his 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 
his metaphysic there was, was very much so, you know, as an idealist, that the ideas of society is where it all begins. So to kind of just draw a Christian metaphor, because um, it's comprehensible to many people, you can see that like God the Father, the state becomes like the Son, as it's expressed on earth. And then for him, what it is, is that the state or the community that we're born into then creates a geist, a spirit. Absolutely, and that yeah. spirit becomes the thing that, that's, uh, you know, what we then kind of have this allegiance to, that we're, you know, as we're, these later thinkers that we're born into and we have to act within. Uh, so th- I was just thinking that there's a, there's a parallel to that. If we're looking for that metaphysical strand, at least back in Hegel. Now, of course, Marx thought this was ridiculous. It's the material conditions. It wasn't for him. He, in fact, said it was ridiculous. He said that one of his jobs was to free Hegel from his mystical shell or something like this. Exactly. Um, yep. But he saw that the the ultimate, you know, nature of reality was was material. But when we go back to Hegel, you see this uh, this metaphysical kind of commitment to the I- the whatever the ideas, kind of maybe with a capital I of the world are, um, that those kind of set the stage. And then they give birth to this community, and that community gives birth to a spirit of how that community behaves, and that's sort of the collective will. And then that, of course, is going to feed back to with his dialectic. That's going to inform the new ideas as they evolve through time. And so you have this kind of cyclical process through um, those three levels. And that's kind of what, if you get deep into that, that's sort of the responsibility that human beings would, would have to take up in this sort of collectivist uh mentality that, that we're kind of just orbiting around with all of these different thinkers. Mm-hmm. So I think that we can say right now uh, is, is that we've seen that in, in order to understand what's happening today and in order to, to kind of uh, deconstruct the deconstructionist, if you will, is that we need to understand fully uh, all of the thinkers and all of the, the different philosophies that have come in the last you know, 300 years, let's say, that uh, we've all had to grapple with and as well shaped others along the way that took it further and further and further. And if we're going to unwind things and make sure that we can put things back together, if you will, in, in some sort of semblance of being able for us all to say, well, we understand where this comes from. We, we understand where this idea has had its effect and has evolved and so forth. This is where we need to be. Mm. So we'll pick it up there with our next discussion and go from Marx. And I think, Stephen, we'll end with this. Your comment uh, last night, I think it was, about Marx was what in regards to before World War One and oh what? yes yeah it's interesting uh, the the status that many thinkers have now in the early part of the 21st century and uh, you know we're familiar with this from just the broader world of commerce and merchandising sometimes the best quality product is not the one that is most popular and in many cases the most popular product is kind of second rate and and third rate as more accidental cultural factors that uh, that make it possible. Now, I, I tend to think of Marx. Uh, he w- did have a PhD in philosophy. He was well read. He was a very smart guy. He had, I don't want to say a way with words, but he did build enough of a system. But nonetheless, I do think he was in the second to third rate category in terms of uh, brilliance and 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 and, and uh, efficacy uh, of of his philosophy, just as a as a philosopher. Uh, and I do think, uh, uh, if you were, uh, if it weren't for the Russian Revolution, the fact that he succeeded in inspiring a small group of revolutionaries who, with a lot of energy and a lot of luck, succeeded in taking over a major country and then rehabilitating or reinserting his uh, ideas onto the public stage, Marx would uh, would be in the history books as a second or tri- third tier rate thinker. Uh, maybe a third tier rate thinker. So we, we now, you know, think of people like Schleiermacher and Schelling and, uh, and, and other people. And they're important in the 19th century, but they're not the giants. Uh, Hegel, uh, I don't think he's f- quite first rate. I think he's very important. I do think that uh, his philosophy, in particular <laughs> with the divine statism, as as James is articulating, that felt uh, fed very nicely into the political culture of uh, Germany. Uh, just had, excuse my French, it's asked by Napoleon, and it wanted to uh, rebuild its ego and get its act together again. And so Hegelian philosophy did serve a very important cultural and political uh, purpose. But nonetheless, Hegel is very important, but it's also important to recognize that a lot of times these guys are uh, 
on our intellectual and cultural landscape more for political and cultural value that they can add. Uh, in, in degenerate form, we say it's just an agenda. Right? We can use these guys to further our ideological agenda and not necessarily uh, entirely on their philosophical merits.